and welcome to the Word of Truth, the Sunday School Class of the Air with your teacher, Rod Payne. The Word of Truth. Thanks for joining us again here on the Word of Truth. I could never know exactly what day or time of the day you're watching, but I hear from folks all the time telling me that you are watching, and I thank you, the team thanks you, for watching and for joining in Bible study with us together here on this program, The Word of Truth. The program's been on the air for more than 35 years, and when you consider that it was begun by John Eady and the late Dorcas and Howard Chapman, all those years ago, it's wonderful that the program remains on the air today, but it only does so because of the grace of God and because folks are watching it. Whether you're watching it on television, whether you're watching it online, thank you for watching and being a part of this program and for studying God's Word together with us. I hope you have your Bibles open. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10 today. I'm looking down at my Bible to make sure I'm in the right spot. Mark chapter 10. So I hope you'll have your Bibles open to Mark chapter 10. 10 will be about the middle half to the end of that chapter. So if you don't, if you don't already have it open, open your Bible to Mark chapter 10. Meanwhile, as I like to begin every week's program, I want to say a very happy birthday to any of you who are having birthdays around the 22nd or so of the month of October. This month is racing by. This year has been racing by. And I pray that if you're having a birthday around this time, that you'll have a wonderful or that you have already had a wonderful birthday. If you're celebrating an anniversary around this time, I hope you have a great, a wonderful anniversary as well. As I am always um, saying here on this program, if, however, this time of the month or this time of the year reminds you of the loss of someone, I pray that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And I pray that they are experiencing heaven now. And I pray that you will have that peace that passes all understanding and that calm assurance that one day there is going to be a great and glorious reunion. And I just pray that you will have that peace, that comfort in your heart today as you remember that loved one who's no longer with us right now on this side, but is already enjoying eternity in the presence of our Heavenly Father in heaven. And I just pray that you'll know that peace again that passes all understanding. I'd also like to remind you that we would love to hear from you. You may write to us at the address you see on your screen right now, the Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas. Our zip code is 76301. That address again is the Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, and our zip code is 76301. You can write to us to let us know that you're watching the program. You can write to us to let us uh, know that you need to have our prayer, or you need us to join you in prayer for yourself or for someone else or for a situation. We'd be honored to be able to pray with you, to lift up together your prayer concerns before our Heavenly Father. If you'd like to call us, you may do so during normal business hours, Monday through, Monday through Friday, except on holidays and things like that. But normally during normal business hours, you can call us. And if we don't answer the phone, please leave a message and we will return your call. The number here at the church is 940-723-2764. Again, that number is 940-723-2764. Today, we're going to look at a couple of different things that transpired near what we call the passion of Christ, near towards the end of his earthly ministry before he is uh, just terribly treated and then crucified, but then rises again on that third day. But before we get to that, he is going to once again, and he does this on many occasions, your quarterly, I think, points out that I think it's about 20 something occasions or 20 different recountings that we have within the gospels of Jesus saying, this is what's going to transpire. This is what's going to take place. And he does it over and over and over as much as for reinforcement as also uh, as a foreshadowing of things to come and to remind those who are with him that are close to him in proximity these things are going to happen. They're going to happen to me. And as we're going to learn from today's uh, study, do you really want to be a part of his ministry? The question is going to be posed because if it's happening to him, it could very well happen to those who identify with him, who claim his name. 
You know, around the world, they uh, commemorate a, every year a, a Sunday that commemorates those who live under persecution, who sometimes lose their lives because of not recanting their faith. And other times uh, the persecuted church around the world exists today because there are uh, regimes, there are uh, uh, governments who do not respect the Christian faith, who do not uh, allow it within their nation's confines. And there are Christians who today are suffering for their faith. There are others who are literally being killed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So martyrdom is going on even today. But in the day and time in which we find ourselves today in Mark chapter 10, Jesus is going to talk about his own crucifixion. He died on our behalf, yes. But then he's going to have a couple of apostles who are basically going to say, we want to be with you. We want to uh, share. We want to sit at your left and your right hand. And um, the real question is posed, can we, can you... Speaking to the apostles now, Jesus, can you drink from the same cup? Are you willing to share of the same baptism that I will endure? Now, the baptism that we look at today is that of someone giving a public expression of their newfound faith in Jesus Christ, or perhaps a faith that they've had for years, but they never followed him in believer's baptism. But the baptism that Jesus will be referring to will be a baptism of fire, a baptism of difficulty, a baptism of trans. Uh, I guess, figuration to some degree because he's going to go from one existence to yet quite a different as far as the way things work with him. Now, he is, he was resurrected in an earthly body and he is the son of man. So he is both God and man. But when he is resurrected, when he is raised from the dead, he's raised in power. And things transpire in his life. We've already seen all these miracles prior to his crucifixion and his resurrection. But after his resurrection, he even goes through seemingly a solid surface in order to join his disciples, his apostles, in a closed off room. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem. And as your quarterly also correctly points out, they were going up. Even though you might be looking at a map saying sometimes when you see this expression in the Bible, they're going up, you think, mm, geographically, that look, geographically, rather, that looks like they're going down. But they're going up to go to Jerusalem because it's about a 3,000 foot or so in elevation. I forget, I may, not getting the, I may not be getting the number exactly right, but it's an elevated city. Now, it was elevated because strategically, at the time that it was originally becoming their capital, it allowed them to be able to fight off their enemies to some degree because of its elevation. So the word of God says in Mark chapter 10, verse 32, they were on their way up to Jerusalem because they are leading towards important times in the life of Christ. With Jesus leading the way and his disciples were astonished and those who followed were afraid. Now your quarterly also correctly points out, as do other Bible study materials, that it's likely that Jesus was leading a line of those who were following him because it would have been the practice in that day and time that one who was designated as teacher would have been at the head of the line and the followers or the students, the disciples, if you will, followed in single file behind him. Now, I don't know what the exact pecking order was in this single file, but, you know, back in the summer and June, we had vacation Bible school as we were proud to do every year here at first and many other churches as well. And one of the, well, they lay out the kind of the guidelines for the week. And one of the guidelines every year at Vacation Bible School is we form a single file line when moving from one activity to another, from maybe our classroom to recreation or something like that. And there's always a teacher at the lead of that line. And they always have someone who's assisting the teacher actually bringing up the rear of that line. In this case, Jesus is teacher and he is the rabbi, he is leading, he's at the head of the line. His disciples that are following him, well, they're astonished. But other folks who are more in the periphery, the word of God says in this, in this NIV translation, they were afraid there are some other words in other translations, but basically the same thing is denoted here. They're afraid. 
And your quarterly and other Bible study materials also point out that more than likely they're afraid because they already know that those who are in a, in a position of authority and power, not the Romans, but the people in the Israeli or the Jewish side of things, they don't like Jesus. And they are already starting to make threats about him. There are going to be more after he cleans the temple out next week. But they're already making these noises saying, we don't like this guy. He's upsetting our apple cart. Jesus was in the lead. Others are behind. We are going to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man, we referred to him that way a minute ago, that will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. The Son of Man, as he refers to himself, as Jesus refers to himself, will be handed over to those who are in authority over the Jews to some degree. Obviously, the Romans had the final say and the final authority in things. They were the only ones, for instance, that could condemn someone and then carry out that uh, execution. Okay? So, Jesus is going to be turned over first to those people who should have known better, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They'll condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They could condemn him to death, yes, but they couldn't carry out that execution. Only the Romans could do that. So if I said that incorrectly just a second ago, let me, let me correct that. The Israeli or the Jewish authorities could condemn someone to death, but it was only the Roman authorities who had the power to execute that execution. They will condemn him to death. They will condemn him and hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. The Romans had a, a diabolic way of torturing people before they put them to death, seemingly to hasten their demise on one of the, if not the most, cruel means of execution ever invented by man. The Roman cross and the nailing of an individual's limbs to that cross was one of the most, again, if not the most cruel, it was certainly in the top 10 of the most diabolic and cruel ways to put someone to death. It's, it, it was done that way for a number of reasons, and one of them was it was supposed to act as a deterrent. When that cross elevated off of the ground, and sometimes like the Golgotha, the, the skull, the place of the skull, which was an elevated place anyway in that area, when they were elevated, though, up on that cross, even if it was on flat land, but certainly if it was elevated geographically as well, it was supposed to be a large, large symbolic deterrent to tell people, you do not want to violate our laws. Because there are some of our laws that carry with them the penalty of being crucified, being executed in this horrific fashion. But prior to the execution, they would flog the person with what was described by historians, and, and, and they have found evidences of this, of a cat of nine tails, which was a form of a whip, but it had tails, if you will, leather strap-like items coming out of it, and on a attachment to those straps would be bits of broken metal or glass or shards of pottery, all of them very, very sharp. And when a person was uh, whipped with this, it literally, when coming back, when the recoil, so the whip goes out and strikes the person on their flesh, the recoil or the coming back of that snap of the whip would pull flesh literally off of the person. A horrific way to treat someone. But for the Romans, it sped up the death of the person who was going to be crucified. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Three days later, he will come up out of that grave. Body of Christ, when we look at all the bad things that Jesus says are going to happen in his life, we also need to see that last sentence in this particular, and remember, in the original scroll, in the original uh, writing of this, what we call our Bible, in the original writing of this Mark account of the life of Christ, there were not paragraphs and there weren't sentence structure, there was not sentence structure the way we know it today. But praise God 
down through the ages, those biblical translators who have done such an exemplary job of taking that original language. And by the way, the King James was not the language. I, I know you. I just trust you know this. The King James was not the language in which your Bible, as we call it, was originally found. There are several different languages, Greek, Aramaic, Hebraic. We don't find King James English, which was another one of the really amazing things. And one of the things that ought to uh, tell people, wait, something's amiss with this Joseph Smith mythology, because he is supposedly translating, as he's inspired by God to do, a new account of Christ and, 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 and God's workings and God's dealings. But it often carries almost verbatim lifting of scriptures from the Old Testament, certainly. And it's done in the King James English. Uh, No, the Bible was not written in King James. So praise God for those translators who down through the ages have known the original languages, have been able to translate the wording of that into English where you and I may read it or into many other languages with the Wycliffe Bible translators, for instance, to do amazing work around the world. But in this original language, we see Jesus describing what's going to transpire in his life, what's going to take place. And we know a prophet is true if what they say is going to happen actually does. And what Jesus said was going to happen, happened. But we don't, we, 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 we cannot ignore that last sentence in this paragraph. He, he, all those bad things will happen first. But then it says, then three days later, He will rise. Now, some of you watching this program today, and praise God for all of you who've been praying for our family. We just continue to covet your prayers. But we know what it's like to go through difficult times. My wife is a cancer survivor, for instance. And I can remember going to MD Anderson on several occasions as she would have treatment down there and as she would have treatment here, the various various things they had to do. But we've walked through some difficult times and continue to do so but we trust God in these times and we also know that there's another part coming to the story and in this case Jesus says and then he will speaking about himself in the third tense or the second tense whatever you want to say he will rise Mm, mm, mm. then James and John the sons of Zebedee came to him teacher they said we want you to do for us whatever we ask And I want you to see, and I brought my copy again of the harmony of the Gospels here. I want you to see Jesus has already spoken about those things. And he speaks about them in all these Gospels. It's not just in the book of Mark. He speaks about this in, there's a Mark account, there's a Matthew account, there's a Luke account that you find in the harmony of the Gospels. And then you find here now James and John, and again in this action gospel that Mark is writing for us. James and John are the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. And they came to him and they said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, your quarterly makes this point as well, but don't you think this was a little rude? Maybe not a little, a lot of rude, very rude. Because he's just described a horrific, horrific Uh, torturous um, thing that he's going to be going through. He is going to rise, yes, but he's going to go through terrible things first. And now these guys, so cavalierly, so seemingly uncaring about what he's just described as what's going to take place in his life, they come and say, give us whatever we ask. That's like a child, and I've had three of them. But I've had over the years, especially my youngest, our prodigal, the one we've just really been asking for prayer for for so long. I've had her say to me, will, will you do me a favor? Will you do me any, will you do me a favor? Just tell me yes. Well, how can I tell you yes to, I'll do you a favor if I don't know what the favor is. So what's happening here? James and John say, do whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asks. Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Let one of us, these for These were in those days, and even today to some degree, you know, we have what we call the president's inner circle. And oft times that may include their vice president, but it also may include what they call their cabinet. 
and their cabinet officials are those on the trusted side of things that they say, I'm going to ask my Secretary of Defense, or I'm going to ask my, you know, go on down the list. They, they, they bring those people in when they need to confer, when they need to get counsel, if you will. James and John are saying, put one of us on your left and one of us on your right when you come into your glory in your kingdom. They're still thinking worldly and not heavenly. They're still thinking earthly and not heavenly. They're still thinking about themselves and not about the heavenly future and the kingdom of God. Let one of us sit on your right, the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus says in verse 38. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? The cup to which Jesus is referring is the bitter cup of self-sacrifice. Can you drink, Jesus says, from the same cup with which I'm going to be drinking, with which I've, from which I've already drunk? To be honest with you, Jesus has shown us a sacrificial lifestyle from the very beginning because he is God made man, which means he lowered, he, he, the word of God tells us he made himself a little lower than the angels. Okay. He came down in heavenly. He came down rather from the heavenly realms to the earthly. And he made himself in the form of a man. He was born from Mary, so she's his mom, but the Holy Spirit is his father. And he's now underneath, he's subjugated himself. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He's placed himself, and I know the whole Trinity thing is extraordinarily difficult to understand. I'm not going to pretend to be able to understand it, nor am I going to even have the um, mental capacity to explain everything on this program, but we know that he has placed himself underneath the father's authority. He says, can you, can you, are you willing to go through what I'm going to be willing to go through? What I'm willingly subjecting myself to? And we know that they both do. We know that they're both martyred. One, very early on in the history of the church, and one, if not martyred, I'm sorry, we know that they both suffer for their faith, pardon me. And we know that they're both hounded for their faith. And we know, and we know that they both go through a great deal. And one is actually martyred early on in the history of the church. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup that I drink. And you will be baptized with a baptism I have baptized, I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Many times over these years that I've lived, I have heard people say, we're all going to be surprised by who we see in heaven. Because we're going to be surprised to find people in there, in heaven, up there, there, however you want to describe it, that we here on earth would have said, there's no way they'll ever be in heaven. Why they're dirty or they're unkempt or they don't know the right churchy's phrases or they don't attend the right church or they don't dress in the fashion that I believe someone should dress and attend church or all the way, you know, go on down the line. And we're going to be surprised when we find them there. I think, this is just me personally, but I think we're going to be surprised to see who might be seated at the right and the left hand side says, it's not for me. It's not for me. It, it's, for, it's for someone else. When the other ten heard about this, they were indignant, indignant. I knew I could get that out if I kept trying. They were indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with us. Okay? Not so with believers. Instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. The servant, the diakonos, if you will, uh, the slave, the doulos. um, We see these phrases as being subservient, as being those who place others ahead of themselves. You know, down through the ages in the Baptist church, at least to some degree, it's almost come to a place where the deacon body has some form of a, 
you know, they do have authority because the church grants it to them. But diakonos really comes from that word serve, to serve or servant. And there are those who serve others. And then honestly, do us the servant itself. That means someone who is under the authority of someone else and they have been bought by that person and they are totally at their discretion. Jesus says, whoever wants to be first is going to be last. Whoever wants to be everybody else or over everyone else. No, you've got to be a servant. And don't we see that example with Christ? As I said earlier, he's the perfect example from the very beginning. He showed us he wanted to be a, a servant for all by coming to earth in human form and being willing to go through what he went through as a human and God, but placing himself, as the word says, a little lower than the angels. No, whoever wants to be first must be slave. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came so that you and so that I would know salvation, which means forgiveness of sin, which means a restoration with our relationship with our Heavenly Father. I pray that everyone watching this program today knows Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But if you don't, this last verse is very important in this particular passage. He came to give his life as a ransom. A ransom means you pay what's necessary to free another. Okay, a ransom is most often we hear about it in kidnapping cases. And the person's been kidnapped and someone else pays what's called the ransom or the money to the kid. Well, in this case, it means... I should have died for my sins and I should have been condemned to hell. But Jesus died on my behalf to ransom me, to take my place, to make the payment so that I could spend eternity with him and so that I could know real life while I'm living here on earth. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you'll join us again next week. I want to remind you that we would love to hear from you. Our address is the word of truth. 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas. Our zip code is 76301. That address again is the Word of Truth. 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas. And our zip code is 76301. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know how we can pray for you when you write to us at that address. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week here on the Word of Truth, Word of Truth as we continue our study in the book of Mark. It's a great lesson as it is every week, but I really think you're going to be energized by what you read and what we study together next week. I'll see you next week here on the Word of Truth. You've been watching the Word of Truth from First Baptist Church, Wichita Falls. Join us again next week for the Word of Truth.